a small percentage of asylum seekers from conflict zones makes it to the UK. An even smaller percentage get through the vetting process of the UK border agency and the Home Office to be granted stay. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. However, despite this, many are refused asylum worldwide. In the UK, there are thousands of asylum seekers in detention centres and the majority of these people do not have the right to work here. Asylum Aid is a charity organisation that supports asylum seekers and refugees whilst campaigning for fair treatment. I'm here to see Russell Hargrave, Communications and Public Affairs Officer, to find out more. What role does Asylum Aid play in addressing asylum in the UK? Well, Asylum Aid does two things. We uh, have a frontline legal team who, using legal aid, work with asylum seekers from around the world. Um, but their work informs our policy work as well. So we lobby at the heart of government using the experiences of the legal team to tell us what we need to do with ministers and advisers. What has your experience been of helping asylum seekers? Asylum Aid works with hundreds of people every single year from around the world and any part of the world you can think of where there is conflict, we've helped those people, whether they're fleeing from torture or from rape or from persecution, whether they're adults or increasingly their children. Um, so, for example, we work with women from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which the UN has said is uh, the rape capital of the world, so widespread is rape as a weapon of war there. Um, we also work in less well-known areas of conflict, like Balochistan, a region of Pakistan where there's been an ongoing regional battle now for many generations, and we need to make sure that those people are safe if they ask us for help. Thousands of asylum applications are made in the UK each year, but how many are actually successful? It's actually a smaller number than I think people might imagine. And there are about 20,000 applications each year, of which 6,000 are successful. Those people are offered refugee status. But we also know that there is a backlog building up because those decisions aren't very good. One in four of those people refused asylum and then granted asylum on appeal. In other words, the uh, judge corrects what the Home Office has said. In the meantime, people are left completely in legal limbo with no decision at all. So what we really need is for the government to make sure they get their uh, decisions right first time at that beginning and then build the asylum process from there. 80% of the world's refugees are hosted by developing countries. Pakistan hosts the highest number as the vast majority of refugees stay in the region of displacement. Figures from the UN Refugee Agency state the population of refugees pending asylum cases and stateless persons made up just 0.33% of the population in the UK at the beginning of 2012. Many people here in the UK perceive refugees, asylum seekers to be a burden on the UK taxpayers' money. What's your response? Well, in fact, the people that asylum aid work with are desperate to contribute to British society. They've taken a huge risk to flee everything they know because they're in danger. And now what they want is a fair decision and to be allowed to work and to pay tax and to integrate into society. Um, what the public don't want, and I can completely understand, is to keep chucking public money at a system that we know doesn't work. What we would always say is get those decisions right first time, make sure people who need refugee help receive it, and then build everything from there. The taxpayers' money is also spent on the armed forces. As one of the world's top military powers, British soldiers are deployed all over the world to various conflict zones. The deployment of UK military forces has seen hundreds of soldiers being killed in conflict, and recent figures from the Ministry of Defence state that the war in Afghanistan has resulted in the death of 444 British soldiers since the start of operations in October 2001. Insecurities causing civilians to seek asylum from conflict zones might also lead to British troops being deployed to those places. To get a soldier's experience and perspective, I spoke to former Colonel Lincoln Jopp, who served in many conflict zones, including Sierra Leone, where he's awarded the Military Cross for Bravery. Share with us your experiences of being in conflict zones and the problems you faced. Well, I've been involved in conflicts in Northern Ireland, West Africa, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'd say that the thing which characterises those conflicts primarily is the diversity of things which soldiers get up to and are called upon to do, whether that's 
horrific combat operations where you see the most dreadful things and experience the strongest of emotions, to the delivery of humanitarian aid, to development activity as well. And that's all carried out within the space of a couple of hundred yards and a couple of hours. And the way in which you deal with all those things is primarily in you respond to the training that you've been given and the values that you hold in your heart and you pursue the mission as best you can in order to try and achieve that mission. It's very demanding soldiering and I pay tribute to the men that I commanded in Afghanistan in 2010, uh, some of whom tragically lost their lives fighting for the people of Afghanistan. How did these experiences impact on you and how's it been reintegrating into civilian life? As a soldier, you take strength from wherever you can get it, whether that's your comrades, whether it's your faith, whether it's your family or your support of your nation. And we felt all of those when we were deployed in operations around the world. As for integrating back into civilian life, I've been married for 19 years to a civilian. I've kept up with all my school friends. And so whilst I have been immersed in military life, transitioning back to civilian life afterwards hasn't been a too great a challenge. Knowing what you know now with the, all the experiences you've had of being in conflict zones, would you still have joined the army if you had the chance to go back in time? Well, I joined the army primarily because I thought it was the purest outlet for leadership that there was. And I don't think that's changed. And I would, as that 16-year-old boy again, want to join the army. I have experienced some pretty tough times. I've lost men. I've had men who've had extraordinarily life-changing injuries. I was unlucky enough to get shot myself. Uh, but taking all those things together, actually, I've had a, an amazing time in the Army. It's been a huge honour to serve my Queen and my country and to have had the massive honour of commanding men on the most demanding operations that this Army has ever conducted. British troops perform diverse roles on the ground, from humanitarian assistance through to combat. However, is military intervention by the international community always an effective solution, or does it fuel grievances even further? Um, I don't think so, because um, it doesn't really have much to do with them. And I feel like it's like sort of, um, they're getting into people's spaces and it's going to make people more angry and not, I just don't feel like they should. I don't believe so. I think that that just creates more conflict zones. Um, so it should be between the parties that it originated. Depends if it involves UK or US matters. If not, I don't believe they should. No, I don't think so. I think, I think it only um, tends to aggravate a situation when they do. I can only speak for Britain, you know. I think Britain's done some mostly good things, really. Not unless they can see a very clear way that they can improve the situation. And in many cases, they may only make it worse. It's clear there are mixed opinions on military intervention. However, whether we intervene or not, it's evident that conflict zones have a huge impact on our lives, the economy and global community. Our experts offered possible solutions to armed conflict. Well, they're gonna be specific solutions to dealing with conflict in different parts of the world, that's clear, because they have different trajectories, different dynamics. The issue is, how do we contain and control conflicts? And the key there surely has to be the arms. Armed conflict requires weapons. And which weapons are used, how they're supplied, is absolutely key. We have a situation in which the permanent members of the Security Council are responsible for most of the global arms trade, the formal arms trade. We also have a situation in which there's a massive informal arms trade, often with small weapons. We have to get on top of that issue. We have to contain and control the supply of weapons, otherwise parts of the world will be doomed to conflict traps for the foreseeable future. To um, try and better uh, implement and enforce uh, uh, consistently human rights norms, uh, common uh, uh, legal norms um, within that state, either uh, through the state's own mechanisms um, and also in conjunction with assistance perhaps from other, um, other states where it's uh, wanted. Uh, secondly, of course, 
there's going to be diplomatic channels, uh, political uh, channels, discussion between the conflicting groups which need to take place in order to try and r bring parties to, to the table rather than uh, resort to, to armed conflict. What's crucial as we look at the future of conflict resolution is trying to cohere the what's happening on the military line of operation with what's happening on the diplomatic, on the economic and the political, so that some coherence is brought to that, they go at the same pace, and that probably gives you your best fighting chance of success. The way forward to deal with conflicts, I think, is to address the biggest root driver, which is global inequalities between developed and poorer countries, as well as within poorer countries. And if we do that, we'll be able to address the grievances that can often drive people to get involved in conflict. That means really looking at how we can transform the economic system, dealing with casino capitalism, dealing with banks which are out of control, increasing um, public spending on institutions and public sector, um, and also making sure that we deal with debt issues. All these kinds of things need to be addressed. Regardless of the complexities that initially spark conflict, the consequences are always damaging. War destroys lives, communities and leaves nations with lifelong scars. It seems unthinkable that human beings are inflicting this much pain on each other for reasons of religion, ethnicity, political and economic power. Conflicts around the world are as much of a threat to us as they are to those in the places where they're happening, as they have the power to threaten our civil liberties, global unity and peace. Conflict may be a part of human nature, but humanity is an integral part of human nature too. It's our ability to empathise with others, no matter who they are or where they come from, that may eventually make the world a safer place.